Well, I think we uh, we're going to start. My name is René Thurian. I am chairing this session. So um, it's, it can be that uh, people are still joining and the, the important start is the important stuff is happening in about two minutes. So I just give an introduction about the session. And I want to welcome you all in the session about dementia and migration, uh, which has to be put into the stream of ethnic minorities. We will talk about this a little bit later, but you might read the excellent report from Alza Europe since uh, 2018 available, which is a pretty good roundup of the topic um, in case you're not up to date yet. I'm happy that we are able to meet and would like to give thanks beforehand to the Robert Bosch Foundation which is generously funding this work to Jessica Monses and uh, Tim Schmachtenberg, who organized this session, and Alzheimer Europe to give, to give us the chance to reach a distinguished audience. Last year, several of us met in The Hague to talk about dementia and migration. We planned to travel throughout Europe to meet all the experts in 2020 and to meet again at Bucharest then. However, you all know what had happened and we were forced to adapt. Now we meet online and sorry, we cannot provide catering there. Um, but the aim of our meeting is professional. We want to share the latest research. We want to inform a little bit about approaches, challenges in different countries, and we want to encourage dialogue and sharing of expertise. There will be time for discussion at the end. Um, some of of the uh, presentations, some of them are pre-recorded, some of them live, and there is a Q&A section for urgent matters that is not available today. We're using the chat function of uh, Zoom. We are also available by email afterwards if there are questions. We are, in the, um, we are mentioned in the platform of Alzheimer awesome Europe as well. We have four presentations from different countries, and please read the short bios of each presenter that are provided on the conference platform. First, we will hear about uh, Catalina Tudose from Alzheimer Romania about the situation in Romania as the host country um, of Alzheimer Europe as it was planned. Then Miriam Goudsmit will share work in progress regarding diagnostics and care from the Netherlands. As third speaker, we have Naid Mukadam and Shoraine Brown from the University of College London, will who sh will share results from a survey regarding provision for services. And last but not least, Jessica Monsis and Tim Schmachtenberg will jointly present an update of our uh, EU Atlas on Dementia and Migration. I hope you engage in the discussion afterwards and I would ask Catalina to do to start. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. And first of all, I uh, take the opportunity to invite you all in Bucharest soon. And uh, let's hope uh, there will be better better times. So you are hearing me, yes? It's okay. Um, I uh, uh, kindly ask you to help me with my presentation that has registered. Thank you. So my presentation, it's about uh, the care situation of people with dementia in Romania. So in Romania, dementia is a major societal challenge as a consequence of multiple factors. Um, the main is a notable demographic change in the last decades due to the increase of life expectancy, but simultaneously decrease in birth rates. There is also something specific for Romania, the aging of generations corresponding to the period 50s, 70s, and their replacement by the numerically much more reduced generations after 70s. And uh, there is added also another important factor that uh, uh, there is a high level of immigration of younger population in the last uh, two decades. According to uh, estimates by the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development in 2013, in Romania, the prevalence of uh, the disease is about 4.7% for those over 60 years and at least 300,000 older adults are currently affected by dementia. Um, from them, um, about 20% uh, are diagnosed and treated, the others remaining non-diagnosed. 
looking at the prevalence of mental disorders, generally speaking, Romania uh, is, I mean, the image is not very clear, but the Romania is somewhere with a, a prevalence of 2.2, uh, um, a little bit uh, um, uh, under the level of European, that is uh, European level, that is 4.4. Um, there is a prevalence, uh, a decreased prevalence in comparison uh, with uh, uh, increased prevalence in comparison with Bulgaria and Hungary, who have uh, a prevalence of about 1.8, and less than Czechia, uh, Slovakia, and uh, Estonia. Um, concerning the prevalence of Alzheimer's disease and other types of dementia, uh, comparing with the European Union for both sexes between 90 and 70, 2017, uh, we can see there is a, a slowly, from beginning with 90s, a slowly increase, and we are a little bit, um, uh, uh, the values are more, much uh, in, are increased in comparison with the European level. And the same aspect is, is concerning the incidence. We can, uh, you can see this, and also uh, of daily. Um, so the tendency is um, this one of um, slowly and gradually increase in all this, uh, all this period. Um, concerning the, the care process as a whole, um, we can say that in, in Romania, it's a very unequal um, quality of care. Usually in urban areas and in big university centers, there are developed, um, the care, there are developed services, but and, of, but uh, um, even in this situation, there are developed the extreme poles of the dementia care needed network. Namely, there are developed diagnosis services and uh, the other extreme nursing home care facilities. Many of them function now on private basis. So the, there is also a need in the society and uh, the market answers to this need. But uh, in between, uh, there is almost uh, yeah, very, very, very uh, small, uh, very um, un I mean, it's an undeveloped sector. There is a shortage of community services, so as, for instance, day centers, special units, uh, care units, support services for families and for carers. And if there are, there is a low coordination uh, of these services who are that are available. We can. Uh, mention um, on the other part a uh, high level of knowledges and skills of the specialists uh, and I mean the psychiatrists and the neurology the geriatricians but there is an important shortage of neuropsychologists in fact there is no education specific education in neuropsychology and uh, 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 we can mention a low involvement of uh, general practitioners in dementia care um, usually the primary diagnosis is predominantly uh, performed in the medium or medium to severe stages of dementia. Uh, so that the quality of dementia care is, uh, is behind European standards, but far behind European standards in rural areas where there are not some not developed diagnosis services and also no nor, uh, nursing homes. Um, so, as a conclusion, there is a strong need in Romania for developing and implementation of a national dementia strategy in order to enhance the quality of care and as a consequence, of course, the quality of life of people with dementia and their informal caregivers. Uh, this is the reason that why Romanian Alzheimer's Society, together, together with another NGO the, working with the elderly people, Habilitas, we have um, uh, developed a project uh, that was run in the last uh, two years. And the theme of the project was mental health, focusing on older population, a priority on public agenda. Um, it is finished now, and I will tell you only some words about this project. Um, there were many activities, but we begin with uh, applying a questionnaire uh, online questionnaire who was, uh, that was sent to institutions identifi identified by us at national level as being involved in social medical assistance for elderly people suffering of neurodegenerative disorders and for their families. Uh, unfortunately, only 42 institutions answered, but 
we were quite uh, content because we were in contact uh, uh, with uh, um, all these years in different activities these two years with the insti important institutions all over the country um, like i said the, the, there were 24 public institutions 18 non-governmental institutions uh, as distribution the majority in urban area five exclusively rural area and 14 in both urban and rural areas. There were local institutions, but also six national institutions, 14 uh, districtual institutions, and uh, two regional institutions. So we received answers from different ministries, uh, universities, uh, national institutes, uh, professional associations, um, associations of patients and um, families. And I would like to show you only some questions that we put in the question that I can see that there, is, there are more, the most important. So the first question was about the current mental health legislation, if they consider that it's uh, satisfactory or not. You can see that uh, partially satisfactory in the majority, not at all satisfactory, satisfactory and sufficient, three of them. Of course, the, the number is small, but um, um, there were uh, significant institutions in Romania that had answered. Questions two, does the current mental health legislation covers the medical and social needs of people with dementia and their carers? You can see that partially, not at all, satisfactory eight and sufficient only two. The two is quite a constant number at the questions. Um, the number of available medical and social services. Look at the, the majority ac ac accepted the, the idea and recognized that there are insufficient, partially sufficient sum and sufficient again to. The quality of available medical and social services. You can see that the majority, you know, this is really, it's, it's, it's the reality are unsatisfactory, satisfactory is that some good, very good, only one, very poor quality, two. Um, an explanation of this kind of answer is that also the, the quality of care is extremely unequal in Romania. So some could also refer to um, nice facilities, a good clinical practice, but these are very few at the national level or are significant. Question five, if there is a feedback on the quality of existing services formulated by the patients or by their relatives. And you say partially, there is no procedure at all, says some people, partially, the majority, not at all, always only seven. Concerning the effectiveness of medical and social services, now doesn't cover at all, um, partially covers and covers all the needs is only one from 42 institutions um, asked that we, we have asked, we have questioned. Accessibility of medical and social services is a very hard to reach, hard to reach, accessible 15 from 20, 42 and easy to reach only two. So in this situation, uh, we continue, we used to have um, a lot of other activities. I mean, um, uh, um, I refer to uh, meetings that we have organized in different areas of the country with smaller group of representatives of these uh, institutions. And we discussed the different, there were a lot of debates and some um, uh, the, in the last year, we asked them to propose things to, to uh, give ideas what it has to be done in, in Romania for concerning, and these are the main themes, so what kind of, what types of services we have to develop. If there is a special need for legislative changes, if there is a need and how big for public services or for private services, or there is, there is a special need for improvement of relations with the patients and with the, their, their families. Um, so that um, uh, finally um, we summarize um, all the ideas and um, uh, we, we 
sorry, um, we need, uh, uh, there is a, we have to organize things in such a way that we have to establish the needs and resources in promotion of information on neurodegenerative disorders, especially dementia, and in, in the training of the specialists in psychomedical social field. There is important to establish the needs and resources regarding the services for the prevention of neurodegenerative disorders at community level and in the primary care settings. Also, it's important to establish the needs and resources concerning the assessment and diagnosis services for neurodegenerative disorders. Needs and resources regarding the community services for patients and their families and carers. And also needs and resources regarding the institutionalized care facilities. So that we have set up a policy in this, in this domain that was um, advanced to our uh, governmental institutions. Um, um in uh, sorry in order to uh, to establish to establish a plan um sorry uh, there are some options in solving this issue that we um, propose a, a national action plan for 2020 2024 20, uh, and there are some um, let's say first steps that we have proposed First one, um, to uh, succeed to have a, a registration and the classification of people um, diagnosed with various types of dementia in Romania. So that's um, to, to know exactly what kind of, uh, what kind of neuro neurodegenerative disorders people have. A second, prevention, information and awareness of the society regarding neurodegenerative disorders. Third, to develop support and care for patients diagnosed with dementia. Four, developing therapy with all, uh, everything is, uh, we, we understand from this, um, from, in, from treat, uh, and concerning the treatment, different kind and different um, ways, uh, psychological, uh, psychopharmacological, but especially non-pharmacological uh, approaches. Five, the formal, informal, and non-formal education in the field of neurodegenerative disorders. Number six, improving, that we have proposals to improve the legislative framework, including normative acts that regulate the rights of patients affected by dementia and of their caregivers. And um, not the last point, to develop research in, um, in this field. So that is a conclusion. There are a lot of things <laughs> that has to be done in Romania. Uh, this was only a, a step. Um, this project offered us a framework and uh, um, we succeed. Uh, I mean, we didn't succeed to put the people at the same table, um, uh, representatives of ministries before, I mean, in, in another formula. This, uh, in the frame uh, of this project, we succeed to discuss with all these people and to elaborate this, um, uh, these documents. That's, we hope that they will, be, they will take into account and uh, we will go further to the next step to, to, to apply, to implement, uh, implement it. Thank you very much for your attention and I will uh, wait for questions. Well, thank you very much, Catalina. Um, we will have we have no other questions in the chat, so we will come back to this after the uh, all we had presentations. It is important to have this European perspective where each country, each culture, each nation, each ethnic minority is standing and uh, moving a little bit forward after the diagnostics. I think about the utilization of services. And uh, Shovan Brown, I would provide the floor for you now. So thank you very much for inviting us to speak here. Um, we uh, and it's been really good to sort of hear about other other people's work. And I, uh, I did have a question for Catalina, but I, I'll have to wait till the end to, to ask because I I missed the window in writing it in the chat. Um, so um, so we wanted to do a survey to see um, how people from diverse ethnic backgrounds are. Um, you know, how well they are served in our memory service population. 
Um, so, um, uh, just some acknowledgements. So, so yeah, sort of dementia is a growing problem in the UK, as with many other countries. Um, predicted to be 1.6 million by 2040, and and costing you know quite a lot. So, I think it's you know it, it, it's it's really important to be um, mindful of that, and also that because of the that it seems that the the ethnic minority population. The a is aging um, a sort of at a faster rate, so it's it's younger at the minute. But um, in the next sort of twenty years, it's estimated that um, prevalence of dementia will um, increase by more than seven times compared to the prevalence within. Um, well, compared sorry, numbers will increase by seven times compared to a doubling in the majority population. Um, and just an overview, because it it might be different in different countries, is how. Um, how we assess people with memory problems in the UK. Generally, people are referred by their GP, so their, their primary care physician, to memory services. And um, they're given an appointment. It's used sometimes a home visit that they're given and sometimes they come to clinic. Uh, more often a home visit, certainly in the areas that I've worked in. And um, they have a specialist assessment, usually by a nurse or a doctor, um, which involves um, taking a history, some cognitive testing, and also their primary care physician might have done uh, blood tests beforehand to rule out reversible causes. And then they'll have some sort of brain imaging and neuropsychological testing if needed, if the case is particularly complex. And then they're um, invited back for diagnostic feedback in order to tell them you know, what we think the diagnosis is. Um, and then a management plan is, is made for them. Uh, so these are the main treatments that we offer. So initially, there's you know a risk assessment really to sort of make sure that the person is safe and that they're being appropriately cared for. Medication, of course, cholinesterase inhibitors, and then um, um, all memory services are uh, encouraged to offer cognitive stimulation therapy and STAR, so strategies for relatives, which is a, um, a group um, evidence-based intervention for uh, carers of people with dementia. And now uh, medication, while relatively straightforward, still involves being able to explain to someone what the medication is for, its intended benefits and risks, and, and there are some sort of translated leaflets about this. I think more complex are the um, cognitive stimulation therapy, which is still not translated, although the, you know, there are plans to uh, culturally adapt this and, and translate it. Uh, and then the strategies for relatives, which we've been doing some work in translating and culturally adapting, um, but uh, it's still really in its early days. So, so you can see that sort of already for, in terms of post-diagnostic support, I think people from minority ethnic groups will have a much reduced service compared to uh, white British people or, or people who are more, um, more fluent in, in English. Um, so we have a large minority ethnic population, about 15% of the total population, but 40% in London, um, which is where um, I'm myself and Shivana based. Um, and as I said, there's sort of numbers are expected to, uh, numbers of people with dementia from minority ethnic groups is expected to, you know, really massively increase compared to the majority population. Um, and as uh, 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 Miriam's mentioned, there's, you know, there are barriers to help seeking. So although we think that there's an increased prevalence because of, you know, additional, uh, a greater frequency of risk factors in minority ethnic groups, uh, they're less likely to uh, come forward. So there's a delay in diagnosis, lower cognitive scores um, at diagnosis, but a younger age. So uh, indicating a greater, um, a greater sensitivity to, to getting dementia. Um, and uh, the sort of last survey of memory services uh, in the UK was done in 2002, and that one found that about a third of memory services had no specific provision for minority groups. So we're hoping that things have moved on since then. Um, so at, at the moment, there are um, guidelines on dementia services. So we wanted to see what is currently recommended as best practice in terms of meeting the needs of uh, minority ethnic groups. So we looked at the, our national dementia strategy, the Memory Service National Accreditation Program, which seeks to sort of, you know, provide um, certification for memory services that are, you know, providing a good service, and also the National Institute for Clinical Excellence. And, and the general guidance is that all memory services should meet the needs of everyone, 
there should be interpreters who are skilled and knowledgeable in, you know, in healthcare um, settings, particularly, and you know, these services should be accessible for everyone and shouldn't just rely on cognitive tests in order to make a diagnosis. So based on these, we developed a questionnaire and I'll now hand over to um, Siobhan. Um, just a, a sort of, oh, just sorry, my last slide, I think this is just, these are the, the um, cognitive screening tests that we widely use, uh, MMSE, the ACE3, the MOC and the GP COG, but they've mostly been developed in English and they may be biased as you are probably all aware against native, not, you know, non-native English speakers or those with limited education. And as mentioned, the RUDAS is, is, is better, but it's less widely used. So we wish to assess whether current services provided in memory clinics are reflective of national policy, uh, particularly with, with approach to the assessment and management of individuals with memory problems from minority ethnic backgrounds in the UK. Thank you, Nihid. Um, so continuing on with methods, so using the NHS research decision tool along with UCL's research guidelines, the study was defined as a service evaluation, therefore ethical approval was not required. From here, after I had identified the study's main research object objectives, as well as the target audience, I designed and developed a survey using the National Policy for Dementia Diagnosis in the UK as the rationale for the questions. The questions of the survey measured the following constructs, patient demographic, patient referral, um, interpretation facilities, translated materials, cognitive assessment tools, as well as barriers to dementia diagnosis and networking. The memory, survey, the memory survey itself was distributed by NHS England, as well as the, national, the Dementia um, Clinical Network to memory clinic leads across England and Wales. During the, the study, we did realise the effect that the COVID-19 outbreak may have, and therefore we did have to make some adjustments. For example, we had to ensure the study was completely conducted online, as well as sending multiple reminders to memory assessment services to kind of engage participation. And when we did realise that our response rate was still relatively low, I directly contacted memory assessment services to try and increase our response rate. Another adjustment we did have to make to the study was to our introductory letter, which was sent to all memory assessment services. And here we had to instruct um, participants that when they were answering the questions, to think prior to the year before COVID, and this would be where clinical routine practice would be taking place. And this is primarily because we recognised the effects that COVID may have on memory assessment service activity, for example, the redeployment of staff members, as well as the lack of face-to-face -face consultations between psychiatrists and patients. So moving on to results and starting with interpretation facilities, approximately 726,000 people in the UK are reported to not be able to speak English well. And this may affect some factors of diagnosis, for example, during cognitive assessments related to a patient's ability to understand the questions. National policies for dementia diagnosis do recommend that memory assessment services should be able to recognise the linguistic and cultural differences that there are in minority ethnic patients and to only use family interpreters in exceptional circumstances. And this is mainly because using a professional interpreter does provide some degree of accuracy in delivering diagnostic feedback, which may be a factor that it's limited by a family member's ability to appropriately translate medical terminology. So in line with this, our study did show that um, participating, uh, that 65% of participating memory assessment services did use professional interpreters in, 60, in 71 to 100% of cases where a patient did not speak English fluently. Um, and this is compared to, again, the majority, 65% using family interpreters. However, only in zero to 10% of cases where a patient did not speak English fluently. Our study also revealed that the main reason for using family interpreters was due to a lack of availability of, an inter or of a professional interpreter in a required language. So overall, what this does suggest is that memory assessment services seem to provide and use professional interpreters to support the diagnosis of minority ethnic patients. So moving on to translated materials, 
Here we found that memory assessment services are offering a range of translated materials and in a range of languages, with the most common resources being translated as information about dementia diagnosis, followed by leaflets about, about medication, and lastly, information about dementia subtypes. And these resources were available in a range of languages, and the three most common were Punjabi, followed by Urdu, and lastly, Bengali. A key theme I did identify when I was analysing these findings were memory assessment services use of the internet to source readily available translated materials. And what this does demonstrate is that memory assessment services are able to recognise that communication barriers, particularly language, may be an obstacle to diagnosing minority ethnic patients. And when they do recognise this, they do actively try to overcome these obstacles to kind of diminish its effects on um, diagnosis of minority ethnic patients. So moving on to cognitive assessment tools. Um, all of our participating memory assessment services were able to recognise that cognitive assessment tools that are used for the majority population may not be suitable for use on minority ethnic patients. And this may be for a range of factors such as difference in culture, language, English proficiency, um, and potentially different baseline cognitive assessment scores. The National Policies for Dementia Diagnosis also state that memory assessment services should not solely be relying on cognitive assessment schools. And in line with this and reflecting this, our study did find that a large majority, so 70% of our participating memory assessment services, did report using alternative cognitive um, standard and validated cognitive assessments to diagnose minority ethnic patients, um, with the two most common being the Roland Universal Dementia Assessment Scale and the translated versions of um, the Adam Brooks Cognitive Examination Test. And also reflecting national policies, we also found that memory assessment services were not solely relying on cognitive assessment scores. They were also deploying other strategies, such as gaining an understanding of a patient's cultural beliefs, as well as using collateral information, whether that be from social networks or family members, and assessing a patient's functioning as a whole to get a more coherent understanding before forming a diagnosis. So the final part of our study looks at barriers to dementia diagnosis and networking, which I'll briefly touch on. So we, here we did find that all participating memory assessment services were able to recognise that there are barriers to diagnosing minority ethnic patients, for example, language, stigma, um, a patient's own understanding of dementia. And they considered communication barriers, particularly language, to be a major obstacle to dementia diagnosis in minority ethnic patients. There was also some evidence of networking between memory assessment services and social networks, with the three most common networks being between local voluntary sectors, followed by community centres, and lastly, local places of worship. So what can we conclude from the study? What did we conclude from the study? So our study appears to suggest that memory assessment clinics are recognising the linguistic and cultural needs of minority ethnic patients. They do attempt to overcome some of the obstacles and they seem to provide culturally sensitive and appropriate services. And all in all, this does suggest that memory assessment services are, are practising in reflection of the national dementia policies, which to briefly reiterate include factors such as not solely relying on cognitive assessment schools, using professional interpreters who are sufficiently knowledgeable, making services accessible to all, as well as providing these culturally sensitive and appropriate services. And although our response rate was relatively low, making it difficult to suggest or generalise that all memory assessment services across England and Wales are kind of practising in reflection of these national policies, what it does show is an initial indication as to how well these memory assessment services are reflecting policy in regards to diagnosing and managing minority ethnic patients. So what can we learn from this research? What can we take and where can it head? So the MSNAP guidelines does state that staff should fulfill competencies in higher education dementia core skills, which includes training in topics such as culture, inclusion, diversity. Um, and this is a topic that I was unable to include in, my, in the study. However, um, I do think it would be quite important because this ensures that healthcare professionals are better equipped to deal with cultural diversity. And this is primarily because it includes reaching targets or objectives, such as the ability to adapt um, cognitive assessments, uh, care planning and interventions. 
Secondly, there's also abundant room for, for research to look at memory clinics views on national dementia policies, for example, the NICE guidelines, MSNAP and the National Dementia Strategy in regards to healthcare professional, professionals use um, regarding diagnosing minority ethnic patients. And this would provide an insight into healthcare professionals or memory assessment services views on the effectiveness of these um, national policies, whether they are there is a big enough consideration for minority ethnic patients, and with the ever increasing population um, for minority ethnic patients, this should really be reflected in national policies. Is there a big enough consideration for them? Are they relevant to our own understanding or our own knowledge of what the facilitators of help seeking and use of dementia related health Care are as well as the obstacles. Um, are they effective enough in supporting healthcare professionals, um, all in order to provide services that are culturally appropriate and sensitive to facilitate timely and accurate diagnosis for these patients? Thank you for listening and thank you for your attention. And we open the floor to any questions. Yes, thank you very much, uh, both of you. Um, very interesting, and uh, it's very encouraging that there is um, if people or uh, institutions recognize the problem, they try to solve it. So that's a good good sign uh, for all of us. Uh, there are just a few questions that might be good to answer right now. It comes with the methodology of the study. Um, just a question: How many um, might have missed it? How many uh, services were sent back? How many clinics? And um, the one where you probably just say yes, is it possible that you have a bias in your study that uh, people answering were had a special interest in cultural diversity anyway? Please. Yes, yeah. I mean, I think, you know, there, there is obviously a concern about bias and um, you know, we, this was a real challenge, which is why uh, my my question for the first speaker for Kathleen was, was uh, you know, how, how did you send out your questionnaire? Because actually I thought 40, what is 47 out of 90 something was, was amazing <laughs> because we got a 10% response rate. And that was with quite, you know, quite a lot of chasing up, uh, you know, we sort of started by using national networks and then Eventually, it was just a, you know, we had a sp spreadsheet of a list of all the, you know, memory services and we're just ringing them and emailing them frantically. So I'm impressed at a sort of 50% response rate. But yes, bias is always a, a concern. And, you know, the people who didn't respond at all, um, you know, maybe their provision for minority ethnic people is, is particularly bad. So, uh, Yes, and uh, and I, I think someone's asked if uh, oh Sana, hi Sana, nice to see you again. Um, will it be published soon? Um, I I sincerely hope so. I think you know we are writing it up for publication, and um, uh, you know it's just that uh, hopefully they they won't count the ten percent uh, response rate uh, too much against us. Um, so we'll we'll see. We will we will get it published somewhere. I think hopefully. Uh, okay, thank you. Shavani, you want to say something else or is it fine? Oh, just thank you. Yeah, thank you for your attention. <laughs> <laughs> All thank right. Uh, the, the reason for me to, um, to, to have this question in the open public now is uh, and I think we all are aware that the, that it is a, a huge issue, migration and dementia, and there's huge methodological problems, obstacles, and it is hard response rate, even get to the settings. And uh, I just wanted to make sure that we all agree that this is not the usual epidemiological or experimental uh, standards we are dealing with here. We want to, but it's, it's just hard. Yeah. It's a complex issue. And it gets more complex in the next presentation because my colleagues, uh, Tim and Jessica, they are trying to do in the project funded by Robert Bosch Stiftung um, to get an overview across whole Europe about the situation of dementia and migration. And uh, I give the floor to both of them to uh, present the results or the, the work in progress of the EU Atlas on Dementia and Migration. Jessica, Tim. Yes, uh, thank you. And thank you all also for joining our session and also to uh, the presenters before. I thought your talks were really um, fascinating and interesting. And now Tim and I, we are excited to show you the current state of our project and the results we have gathered so far since um, last year when we presented this idea of an EU atlas at the Alzheimer Europe conference in The Hague. So um, Tim, I don't know if you want to say something before. 
I don't know many things, um, and yeah, we have um, pre-recorded um, our presentation, and yeah, let's start. Hello, my name is Jessica Monzes, and I would first like to thank you for your interest in our presentation. The EU Atlas on Dementia and Migration is a project that my colleagues Tim Schmachtenberg, Vinny Thurian, and I are working on since last year, and it is funded by the Robert Bosch Stiftung. And now Tim and I will show you what we are working on and our results that we have so far. To start, I will give very shortly a few facts on the topic. It is assumed that the number of people with dementia is expected to rise from almost 10 million people to almost 40 million people by 2030 in Europe. In this group, people with migration background are of special vulnerability, and there's only few prevalence data available on this, but a recent analysis estimates the number of people with migration background with a dementia to be about 468,000 people in uh, the EU and EFTA countries. What we know is that in the group of people with migration background, dementia is underdiagnosed for various reasons like a lack of adequate diagnostic tools. They also tend to utilize healthcare services less often, also for different reasons, such as stigmatization or missing information and awareness. So what we do in our project is to analyze and to illustrate data on prevalence of dementia in people with migration background for the EU and EFTA member states and also for the UK. We also analyze guidelines on care, treatment and diagnosis to see how they consider people with migration background. And we also do that with national dementia plans. Then we take a look at healthcare systems and healthcare services and analyze if and how they refer to people with migration background. By doing that, we want to raise awareness, but also provide people working in the fields of dementia, migration, dementia and migration, as well as policymakers and stakeholders with information. And now Tim will show you our results on guidelines and national dementia plans. Yeah, um, then I will continue with the national dementia plans and an increasing number of countries are issuing national dementia plans, but a systematic overview of national dementia plans of European country focusing on care for people with migration background is lacking. This analysis aims to illustrate how European countries identify the dementia related needs of people with migration background and whether there are specific healthcare services for them at the national level. In this study, a qualitative analysis of national dementia plans of the EU, EFTA and UK countries was carried out. The model of qualitative discourse analysis by Rainer Keller was applied. The online platform of Alzheimer Europe and the search engines Google and Google Scholar served as a database for the documents. The date of the survey was June the 1st in 2019. The data body comprises 25 documents. These documents were systematically screened for their relevance to migration using different K terms. If the migration topic was considered, a content analysis of the section in which it could be located was carried out. For this purpose, the contents were paraphrased memos and comments were added, and the text passages were coding using the strategy of open coding. The categories were derived from the contents of the documents. Afterward, the results were interpreted and assessed. Yeah, and then we move on to the results of this study. Our analysis has shown that 23 of the 35 EU, EFTA and UK countries have a national dementia plan and 10 of these 23 countries have a national dementia plan that refer to the topic of migration. But only one document, the Austrian Dementia Report, has their own chapter on migration. Eight national dementia plans identify that people with a migration background and dementia have special needs that are relevant to dementia care. Reported needs are different communication, language, religious, spiritual, and cultural needs, and different decision-making preferences and or expectations related to disease, diagnosis, and treatment. In most national dementia plans, the focus is on the problem description. The most frequently addressed problems are difficulty or later diagnosis and lower utilization of care services. Cultural and language barriers 
as well as in appropriate diagnostic instruments will enable causes for this. According to the national dementia plans, nine countries plan, plan actions to care for people with migration background with dementia. These countries want to pay attention to the conception of specific information materials, training of caregivers, medical and nursing professionals, or staff of migrant counseling centers, and the development of language and culturally appropriate diagnostic tools. Norway, Northern Ireland, and the Netherlands refer in the National Dementia Plans to available services to improve the care situation of people with a migration background. In the Netherlands, special attention has been paid to people with migration background in the early detection and prevention of dementia. Northern Ireland has developed a self-assessment tool for service providers that contains a whole questionnaire with items around the topic of migration. Now is improving the skills of staff members working with language minorities and developing a program of post-diagnostic follow-up models, including people with dementia and their relatives from other cultural groups. And this map illustrates in the area that most EU, EFTA and UK countries do not have national dementia plans that refer to the care of people with a migration background with dementia. Overall, this analysis has shown that the topic of migration plays a subordinate role in the national dementia plans of European countries. In addition, we have conducted a systematic analysis of national dementia care guidelines of the EU, EFTA, and UK countries. Here we have chosen the same methodological approach as for the dementia plans. This analysis aims to determine the extent to which care guidelines take people with a migration background into account, which content focuses are set regarding dementia and migration, and to what extent specific actions are considered or recommendations are made to ensure appropriate care for this group. 43 documents from 20 EU, 3 EFTA, and 4 UK countries were systematically screened for migration references. And 27 of the 35 EU, EFTA, and UK countries have guidelines or similar documents on the care of people with dementia. 11 documents from seven EU countries, three documents using by the four UK countries, and one document from the EFTA country Norway consider the topic of migration. 28 documents from 13 EU and two EFTA countries do not refer to it. And the guidelines from Norway, Sweden, and Northern Ireland refer to this topic in detail. The focus of the migration-related guidelines is on the early detection and diagnosis of dementia. The main message is that standardized diagnostic tools, such as the MMSE, the Mini Mental State Examination, or the clock test, are not suitable for linguistic minorities. Nine countries make recommendations for the care of people with migration background and dementia. One key recommendation is that the linguistic and cultural background of people should be considered when selecting diagnostic tests. Several countries refer to the validity of the RUDAS, the Roland Universal Dementia Assessment Scale, for migrants. The many gray areas on this map shows that most EU and EFTA countries have not published guidelines on the care of people with migration background and dementia. Overall, this analysis has shown that the topic of migration plays a subordinate rule on the care guidelines of European countries. Almost all countries lack appropriate diagnostic tools and healthcare services for people with a migration background. The results of this analysis are based on a search from mid-2019. The second search will be carried out in the early 2021 to include the newer national documents of European countries on dementia care. Yeah, and that's it for the document analysis. And now Ms. Monses continues with the prevalences. In this work package, we estimate the number of people with migration background with dementia, and we base that on the dementia prevalence of the country the people are living in. So we take the prevalence rate of dementia of a country and apply this rate to the different ethnic groups living in that country. We then create different kinds of maps, which we will show you now for Greece. 
The first map shows the absolute number of people with migration background with dementia on a national level, and we show that for the five largest ethnic groups with dementia. In this case, that would be Turkey with about 1,300 people with dementia, Albania with about 1,100, Georgia with about 850, the Russian Federation with about 800, and Egypt with about 700 people with dementia. We then take the absolute numbers and put them in relation to a reference group. In this map, the reference group is the whole Greek population that is 65 years old or older. So you can say that per 100,000 residents being 65 or older in Greece, there are, for example, about 60 people with dementia originating from Turkey or 40 people with dementia originating from Georgia. We also use the population with migration background being 65 years or older as a reference group. So you can say that per 10,000 people with migration background being 65 or older, in Greece, there are approximately 80 people with dementia originating from Albania or 50 people with dementia originating from Egypt. Then we show for each of the five largest ethnic groups with dementia in which regions they are living in, and we show that in absolute numbers. In this case, you can see that people with dementia that are originating from Turkey they are mostly living in Central Macedonia, Attica, East Macedonia, and Thrace. And what we are currently doing is that we are conducting expert interviews and we are now analyzing the results of 11 countries so far. These countries are Austria, Belgium, Bulgaria, Denmark, Portugal, Sweden, the UK, Germany, Luxembourg, Norway, and Liechtenstein. And we want to give you a short descriptive overview of some of the answers that we got. For example, we asked, according to your opinion, as how important is the topic dementia and migration regarded in your country? Austria says it's very important, while Luxembourg, Norway, and Liechtenstein say it's rather unimportant in their countries. And for the rest of the countries, is, it is at least a partially important topic. For the question, if people with migration background are identified as a vulnerable group, only Liechtenstein says that their healthcare system does not identify people with migration background as vulnerable. Regarding areas that people with migration background could be at a higher risk, most countries identify the lack of care, underdiagnosis, and utilization of healthcare services as risk areas. All two countries note that they don't see people with migration backgrounds at a higher risk in any of those areas. In Liechtenstein, Sweden, the UK, Norway, Luxembourg and Bulgaria, outpatient care for people with migration background with dementia is nationwide available or almost nationwide available. As for inpatient care for people with migration background with dementia, that is also nationwide or nationwide or almost nationwide available. That is also the case in Liechtenstein, Sweden, the UK, Norway, Luxembourg, and Bulgaria. Four countries estimate that their healthcare services are suitable for people with dementia with and without immigration background. Four countries say that services they have are only suitable for people with dementia without immigration background while the other three countries point out that their healthcare services aren't suitable for people with dementia with or without a migration background. Almost all countries see a high or a very high need for specific information and specific services for the family caregivers of people with migration background with dementia. And with that, we would like to thank you for your attention. We would also like to thank the Robert Bosch Stiftung for funding this project and also, of course, the experts who participated in our interviews so far. Yes, thank you very much, Jessica and Tim. Um, we all appreciate the hard work you're doing with, um, and some of the experts, I guess, are in the chat anyway. Um, there are just a few questions. One that was expected was, uh, where can we get copies of these results? Please uh, give a deadline. <laughs> yes. Um... 
The results, they will be released in form of this atlas we talked about as an online and in print version. And right now we are working on it. We're writing the country profiles. We're still in the process of doing um, interviews and creating these maps. But we plan to release the atlas in April and May um, the next year. So you have the email addresses of Jessica and Tim, and you can just send them a, a, a quick reminder that you're interested in the results, if you are. Another question that is um, um, popped up in the chat room is from Franziska, and I think that's a question that goes to all of us, basically. Um, she is asking, uh, Tim and Jessica specifically, whether we had included experts by experience in our expert interviews. And I think that's, that touches the topic uh, of um, are we doing research with or about people? And uh, please give an answer for our new atlas. Uh, yes, the experts we interviewed are people that are working in the field of dementia immigration in a best case scenario. And for the countries we interviewed so far, it was mostly the case, but um, we also have one or two countries where we couldn't find really an expert on dementia immigration, but in that case we had an expert on dementia or expert on migration. Exactly. I hope this answers. We, we did not have any expert by experience that uh, was diagnosed with dementia and had a migration background. Oh, okay. So, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> sorry. Much further. And I don't know how the others have included uh, people by experience in there. This goes to the whole floor, whoever wants to answer. Miriam, Chauvin, Nahid, Catalina. Anyone? Miriam, you're well, okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, we're, well, it's, it, we're actually planning to, um, it's a sort of sub project where we look into uh, the way uh, older migrants want to be informed about their medication use. And for this project, we decided to interview uh, not only them, but also their caregivers in, uh, in their own language, in focus groups. And the focus group um, way of um, going into things we did before. And uh, it always helps a lot if uh, researchers with the same cultural background as the people that you want to interview uh, participate because they have a sort of network, they can do a snowball approach. And uh, in general, what is also helpful is that uh, when we look for students for their master thesis that do parts of our research, we always look for people that are uh, that have uh, that probably are second or third generation Turkish or Moroccan, uh, so they have their network and their language profic proficiency in the given languages. Okay. But yeah, it's it's pretty hard uh, to reach the group. There's a big distance sometimes. Yeah, yeah. So you can break up the distance by including people from the same cultural background, but the people with dementia themselves are not included. For this new uh, topic, they will okay. uh, they will be included, yeah, together with their caregivers, yeah, yes. yeah. Um, Nait, um, just she was was she saying wanting to say something, or Shovan, are you want, what do you want to say something about the UK or Catalina? If you open your microphone. Um. Whoever is first. I, I would like to, to answer to the comments done. Uh, I would like to say that it was, a, it was in our paper, in our work, it was a work of many, many years. So, you know, the ministries and all these people didn't use to answer many times, but in, in the last years that they come at the conference and things like that, but we take the advantage of a project because being an official project run by Romanian uh, uh, officialities that they answered, you know, it was an, a, we make a, a kind of, uh, you know, we take an advantage, advantage to create a project to put people to together and to answer that it was normally to be done in normal <laughs> activities and relations. So that's, this was, that's why it was a result, but anyway, half of them. So I wanted to stress this. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. There is already many things going on in the, in the chat. Um, key community contacts are important to reach them. 
Um, there is a paper, how to involve people with um, a migration background with dementia and their family caregivers. There are, um, Faros in the Netherlands is trying to do this in new projects. So there is, there is the need to involve them, but, and it's under plan of the researchers. Shuvan, you showed your video. Do you want to say something about this? Put your microphone on, please. <laughs> Could you repeat the question, please? Oh, sorry. The, the question was, um, did you experience, uh, did you per, uh, let uh, people with dementia and with migration, migration background participate in your studies? Or is this planned? Or how do you? Um, so our study just used, so the healthcare professionals working at memory assessment services, so it was no patients. Yeah. Did you check whether they had a different cultural background? No, we didn't actually, yeah. All right. Well, thank you. Um, and I see we are already uh, uh, over the time um, and the connection will close. So let me wrap up what we have heard. There is so much that we have heard. We heard that um, there are, the countries start from different levels. We heard from Romania where the, the general provision of care is already um, a, a, a big challenge. We heard from the Netherlands with a focus on the diagnostics with the, with the, with the tools. We heard from the UK with the services becoming more cultural sensitive or at least recognize it a little bit more. And we heard about the EU Atlas where we try to get the European perspective on all of this. Everything was very valuable, very much was new to me and interesting and keeps me thinking. And I will thank you again for giving your presentations to this hot topic, the complex issue. And I hope that this will, um, will follow up with email contact, with uh, some networking activities. Uh, I hope that the anonymous people in the chat room will identify themselves towards others when they have questions or, or reach them. The conference platform is perfect for that because I don't know whether you have uh, checked it already. There are other contacts. There is a little bit of background about the presenters and I think um, we will present next year again how the work has yeah, been done forward. Thank you very much for participating. Thank you. Thank you. And bye. Bye. -bye. Thank bye -bye. you. Goodbye. Have a nice day. Bye. Thank you.